Philippians chapter 2, and let's begin reading at verse 19. The Bible says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him alone, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. And I want you to bow your heads as we open up in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. In the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God, for all that you've done already, God. We thank you for your beautiful presence that is here right now, God. And I pray that you would continue to fill this place, Lord. I ask that you would speak to us as a church, as individuals this morning, God. I pray that every one of us would leave here, God, changed, God change to be the man and woman that you've called us to be, God. I pray in the name of Jesus, and we'll give you all the honor and all the glory. Use me as an instrument in your hand. Once again, in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen. Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus is only mentioned in the Bible twice, right here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, and also Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. And Epaphroditus was a young man that was there in the city of Philippi, of Philippi. And he was actually sent to Paul while Paul was on his first, while Paul was in prison for the very first time there in Rome. Paul calls him my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. It's known that Paul regarded Epaphroditus as someone that had a common sympathy for God's people. Paul also regarded Epaphroditus as somebody that shared in the labor that Paul was called to labor in. And also Epaphroditus was willing to go through danger and toil and, and suffering. And on his arrival to Rome, Epaphroditus, he devoted himself to the work of Christ, both as Paul's attendant and also as assistant in missionary work. This, this, this was Epaphroditus. Now, the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest men that we read about in the New Testament besides Jesus. And I've studied extensively on the life of Paul. And every time I read about him, I get more amazed how God used him so dynamically. Paul was truly chosen, handpicked, anointed, used in supernatural ways by God. So we read here in the book of Philippians the description that Paul gives concerning Epaphroditus. And it tells me that Epaphroditus must have been a great man of God. Everyone say a great man of God. Amen. He must have been a great man of God if Paul gave this description of Epaphroditus. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I want to be known as a great man of God. And I know there's many women here today that want to be known as a great woman of God. Now, Paul also said this, and he says that I want you to honor men like him. In verse 29, it says, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. So Paul was writing the church in Philippi. He says, I'm hoping to send Timothy to you soon which we know that Timothy was Paul's prodigy. And Paul loved Timothy as a son. 
He says, I'm not sending Timothy right now, but I am sending back to you Epaphroditus. And as soon as he mentioned these words to the church in Philippi, immediately after he says who he's sending to them, Paul starts to give a description of who he's sending. Now, I wonder how the Apostle Paul would describe you and I today. Or, for that matter, how do others describe us? What's mentioned in the same sentence with our names? Now, I wonder how people describe you and, all, you and I. Paul was giving a personal description of Epaphroditus. And a personal description coming from Paul carries a lot of weight. Just like a personal description by others today about us carries a lot of weight. Do you know that we can ruin somebody by the way we speak of them? Come on, somebody. Huh? A personal description by others today carries a lot of weight. And I want us to see how Paul describes Epaphroditus. And after this morning, I hope and pray that every one of us would strive to have this type of description about ourselves. Come on, somebody. Now, first of all, Paul says this, but I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Now, first of all, I think we should all be grateful that we weren't named Epaphroditus. Before we get into God's word, I think we could rejoice this morning and be glad that our name is not Epaphroditus. Now, if your name is Epaphroditus, I'm not coming against you or talking bad about you. And if you're watching online right now and your name is Epaphroditus, don't get mad. But I'm glad my name is not Epaphroditus this morning. Paul says, I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. And then he says this. The description starts with this. My brother. My brother. Now, this word brother in New Testament Greek, the word that Paul is using, it means this, a fellow believer, but also it means this, united to another by a bond of affection. United together by a bond of affection. Now, this word bond, it means a, a force or a feeling that unites people. A force or a feeling that unites people. A common emotion. Something that gives people or groups a reason to love each other or feel that they have a duty to one another. This is the bond that Paul is describing that Epaphroditus and himself have. When Paul says, he is now my brother, he is saying, man, I have a bond of affection towards Epaphroditus. Now, a bond of affection, it causes things to take place. First of all, it causes genuine concern and unity. And I'll tell you something, church. Listen, I want to remind our church here in Bakersfield that we're not called just to be a community church right here in our beautiful city. God has called us to be a base church. He's called us to be a mega church. He's called us to be a church that we have men and women that are ready to be launched out to any part of the world for his honor and for his glory. So we're not called just to play church on Sunday morning. He's called us to be a great church. And in order to have a great church, we got to have some great people. A bond of affection, it causes genuine concern and unity. And if we're going to be that church that God has called us to be, we need some genuine concern and unity for each other. Huh? The Bible says in Psalms chapter 133, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together together. In unity. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul again addressing the church in Ephesus. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I'll tell you right now, we need some more brothers in the church. Huh? We need some more sisters in the church. We need people that have a bond of affection towards one another. People that are genuinely concerned for each other and concerned for unity in the house of God. Without unity, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. 
And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Mark chapter 3 verse 24 says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. Mark 3 25 says, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And I'll tell you this morning, we want to build a church that is able to stand the attacks of the enemy. And the only way that we can have this type of existence is there has to be some unity in God's house. This word brother also means one who shares an allegiance or purpose. And I'll tell you something, we are all sharing in the same purpose. Every one of us, those of you that are here right now and those of you that are watching online right now, listen, we are here for the very same purpose. God has given our ministry a great calling. And if this church is going to be the church that God is able to build a mega church out of, then we need more unity, more brotherhood in the house of God. United together by a bond of, of, I said this morning, of infection, but affection. Amen? Amen. Listen, church, instead of criticizing one another, let's start caring for each other. Huh? Instead of criticizing each other, let's start caring for one another. You want to see God do some great works in the house? and You want to see the Lord do some great works in your house? And you want God to do a new thing in your life? Start caring for God's people. And stop criticizing. There's a story that I've read before. In ancient Greece, Socrates was reputed to hold knowledge in high esteem. One day, one fellow met the great philosopher and said, Do you know what I just heard about your friend? Hold on a minute, Socrates replied. Before telling me anything, I'd like you to pass a little test. It's called the triple filter test. Triple filter, that's right, Socrates continued. Before you talk to me about my friend, it might be a good idea to take a moment and filter what you're going to say. That's why I call it the triple filter test. The triple filter test is truth. Have you made absolutely sure what you are about to tell me is true? No, the man said Actually, I just heard about it. All right, said Socrates. So you don't know if it's true or not. Now let's try the second filter. The filter of goodness. Is what you are about to tell me about my friend something good? No, on the contrary. So, Socrates continued, you want to tell me something bad about him, but you're not certain it's true. You may still pass the test, though, Because there's one filter left, the filter of usefulness. Is what you're about to tell me about my friend going to be useful to me? No, not really. Well, concluded Socrates. If what you want to tell me is neither true, nor good, nor useful, why tell me at all? See, this morning I want us to understand that it's about time for our church to get past the criticism. Huh? Don't worry about everybody else's flaws. Just worry about ourselves in the area of character. Come on, somebody. And you say, well, pastor, is that biblical? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Huh? So this morning, listen, we got to get past the criticism. Don't worry about everybody else in the church, what they're going through, what they're feeling, what's happening in their life. Now we have care and we have concern, but stop criticizing their character. Huh? Because every person in this church right now, every staff member, every leader, every intern, every member, every one of us have flaws in our life. And guess what? We don't need you to point every one of them out. Huh? Why are you worried about the sawdust in your brother's eye and not paying attention to the plank in your own eye? Huh? Yeah, let's, let's, 
Just cut it out. Stop playing. Huh? Paul describes Epaphroditus as a brother, a fellow believer, united together by a bond of affection. Listen, brothers have each other's backs. Huh? Now in the world, we used to have to worry about our back. Come on, man. Huh? Get people stab you in the back. But not in the church. Not in the church. We, we, we got each other's back. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to battle together with our brothers, with our sisters, and they should not have to worry who's standing behind them. Huh? Brothers have each other's back. So when somebody comes to you and they start telling you a story that they don't even know that is true and it's not going to do any good for them, listen, just cut them off right at point. Tell them, listen, bro, I love you. You love me. The person you're about to talk to, I love them too. So if it's not going to do me any good, and you don't even know if it's true or not, just keep it to yourself. Huh? You know what that's going to do? That's going to kick the devil out of the church. Huh? That's going to kick the enemy and all his little demons out of the church. Why? Because the enemy loves disunity. That's what he works best in. But when we say, no, devil, you are not going to bring that spirit into our church, into our house, into our neighborhoods. Listen, when we say, no, we're not going to fall for the sweet nothings anymore, then that's when God begins to do those new things that every one of us are searching for. We've got to stop playing, though. Uh, got to have each other's back. Now, I'm not saying go out and fight nobody. Don't do that. You just got to stop them in the tracks. Paul says, I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother. And then he says, a fellow worker. Now, remember, this is all a description. And, and then when you read about it, you might even think, well, why is Paul describing Epaphroditus to the church in Philippi when in the beginning, the church in Philippi is the ones, are the ones that sent Epaphroditus to Paul? Why would he describe him? They already know who he is. But I want you to see what happens when you hang around people that are doing the work of God. See, this is what happened in Epaphroditus' life. He might not have come with these characteristics, but when you hang around people that are pressing toward the mark, when you hang around people that are pressing toward their calling, when you hang around people that are doing what God has hand-chosen them to do, something happens to you. Huh? Oh, you don't hear me this morning. Something happens to you when you hang around people that are doing exactly what God has called them to do. When they're on fire, when they're pressing forward, when they're attacking the enemy, not waiting for the enemy. When you hang around those people that have fire that is shut up within their bones. When you hang around people that can't hold back what Jesus has done within their life. Then there's something that happens to you and I. And this is what took place in Epaphroditus' life. Because Paul was sending him back to his own people. But he says, man, before I send you back, I want to write a letter of description about you. So they might have known you before you left, but they don't know the man that you are now. So I'm going to let the people know in Philippi that you have changed, that you've fallen into the hands of God, that there's been a change upon your life, that you've given your law, your heart, your mind, and your soul to the cause of Christ. And I want the people to know this. He says Epaphroditus is a fellow worker. That word worker is a, a companion in work. It means a person who produces or achieves. Paul tells the church in Philippi that Epaphroditus is not only a brother to him, but he's also a co-laborer. A person that produces. Paul says to the church in Philippi, uh, to Philippi, I'm sending back to you a man that is not lazy. Come on, somebody. Huh? Church, I don't know about you, but I never want to be known as a lazy man. Huh? I don't know if everybody has that in them, but I never want to be known as a lazy man, not even to my wife. She'll tell you, I drive her crazy sometimes at home because I, 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 I just don't want to ever 
be known or seen as a lazy man. Huh? Especially by the Lord. Especially by the Lord. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4, it says this. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 says, We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit, inherit what has been promised. Now listen, church, God has given us an allotted time in our individual life. Stay with me for a moment. God has given us, every one of us, an allotted time in our individual lives. John chapter, chapter 9, verse 4, it says this, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no man can work. Now, this scripture is referring to our life span. Every person in this place right now has a life span. And every person's life span is unique just for them. As a pastor, I stand and perform many funerals throughout the year. From newborn to men and women over 100 years old. Every person has a life span. And every person has a lifespan that's different from someone else. When I read this scripture, I think about my dad. My dad was 51 years old when he went on to be with the Lord. 51 years old. I'm going to be coming up in about 10 more years to that. <laughs> 51 years old. But when I think about my dad, it blows my mind. Because right now, I've been serving the Lord longer than my dad served the Lord. Right now, today, I've been serving God longer than my dad served the Lord. But when I think about his life and all that he did with his life span that God gave him in his Christianity, when I think about the, the, the limited time, 51 years old, 51 years old, he got saved when he was around 30 years old. He had 21 years of serving God. In that 21 years of serving God, he was able to do so much. He pioneered the church in Visalia. He launched out to Hanford. He launched out to Miami. He went all the way on the other side of the world. Went right there to Barcelona, Spain. Pioneered a church there. Today, right now, there's four churches in Spain. He came all the way back and pioneered this church that you and I are sitting in right now. 21 years, he did so much with his lifespan. Every one of us have a certain lifespan. And the Bible says that night is coming. What that means is that our lifespan will come to an end. But it doesn't matter when it comes to an end. It matters how much we did with it. That's what it matters. See, when I go on to be with the Lord, I want one of my boys to come up here and testify and preach. Man, my dad served the Lord for this amount of time, but he was able to fulfill the great calling upon his life, and he did what God told him to do. He was able to hit the mark. He pressed toward the mark, and he made it. That's how I want my boys to preach one day about me. We have an allotted time span within our lives. In other words, there's no time to be lazy. That's why yesterday when I was over there at the, at the rally, I was blown away by the amount of people that showed up right there. We took over a liquor store. Come on, somebody. Huh? Right? All these people out there, and I don't know if you guys notice it, but there's people all right there in the middle, in the back, down the alley, down the street, down the street this way, across the street. I, I mean, I was blown away, but... When I seen the people get saved, I was blessed, but I was actually blessed even more when I see the workers out there. Men and women from the church that are out there laboring. Men and women that are out there laboring and, and feeding God's people. Men and women that are out there testifying and sharing the good news of salvation. Men and women that are out there saying, man, I got a busy 
busy Saturday. I have to do this and I got to do that. But I got to do what God has called me to do first. I love to see men and women that are involved in ministry. And that's what Paul was saying about Epaphroditus. He's not only my brother, but he is a co-laborer in the Lord. People always ask me, Pastor, what could I do in the church? Anything, just do something. Huh? Just don't sit around. Just do something. Well, how do I get involved? Just show up. That's all you got to do. Just make yourself available. That's what's so unique about our ministry. You don't have to fill out an application. Huh? Come on, somebody. We probably wouldn't pass it anyways. I'm, I'm talking about myself. If we were in any other ministry and it got to those little bubbles on the bottom. Come on, somebody. Huh? You ever been in trouble with the law? No. Come on. None of us would pass an application to do the work of God. But thank God we have a Savior. Huh? Thank God we have Jesus that raised us up. He says, man, I'm going to use the lowest of the lowest to confound the wise. And guess what? I fit that description. I was the lowest of the lowest at one time. But Jesus said, I'm going to use you to confound the wise. That's why today, listen, don't let the devil keep you down. God has called you. Labor for the Lord. Do whatever the Lord gives you to do. And do it with the whole heart. Night is coming when no man can work. You go to a funeral and on the brochure, as soon as you walk in, depending what funeral you're at, on the bottom of the brochure, it always says sunrise to sunset. And sunrise is the, the date and year that they were born. Sunset is the date and year that they went on to be with the Lord. That's our time span. And that's what we're in right now. We're in a time span. Listen, we're going to meet our maker one day. Huh? Oh, you guys don't hear me. It might be today. Huh? We're going to meet our maker one day. You might say, oh, Pastor Rapture's not coming right now. I've been hearing that since I was born. People have been saying Jesus is coming back. No, you might die today. Huh? You might get in an accident today. Something might happen today. I know my son was shaking up after that, automo uh, uh, that motorcycle accident Friday. He told me, Dad, when I fell, I started rolling, but it was all in slow motion. I was thinking, oh, my God, is this my time? He was thinking, I wonder if I'm going to stop rolling and what's going to happen when I stop? See, you and I, we have an allotted time. We're in our time right now. This is our time right now. We're in the season where God is saying, listen, it's time for you to get up. It's time for you to shake the dust off. It's time for you to stop looking at the negative. Stop looking at the positive because I have a plan. I have a purpose. I have a calling upon your life. And you are in the ministry where you're able to fulfill the plan and the purpose that I have for you. There is no limits in Victory Outreach. Those of you that are here for the very first time and you say, well, pastor, I, I could hear you, but I don't know if I believe you because I came in all messed up and, and you don't know about my lifestyle. I don't care about your lifestyle. I know what God is able to do and it was God that brought you here this morning. <laughs> Take advantage of the time that God has given us. Tell the person next to you, let's not be lazy. Huh? Let me catch my breath for a moment. <laughs> Paul says, I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker. And then lastly, he says, a fellow soldier. Huh? That word soldier, New Testament Greek. It says, an associate in conflict for the cause of Christ. Huh? An associate in conflict 
for the cause of Christ. A soldier is an active, loyal, militant follower of an, or, of an organization. A skilled warrior, a skilled and experienced fighter are military strategists. A brave warrior, a man of distinguished valor. That's what a soldier is. An active, loyal, militant follower. Epaphroditus stood by Paul's side regardless the opposition. He was loyal until Paul sent him back. Huh? Paul says Epaphroditus was his brother, a fellow worker. He says Epaphroditus was a fellow soldier, an active, loyal, militant follower. Now, if you read on Paul's life and ministry, you know that Paul was constantly facing opposition. Not just spiritual opposition, but also physical opposition. Huh? So for Paul to say that Epaphroditus was a fellow soldier, it meant that Epaphroditus was a man that was down for the battle. Epaphroditus was ready. Not only ready, but he was willing. He was a man that stood his ground. He was a man that wasn't intimidated. He was a man that didn't allow circumstance to move him. He was a man that braced himself back to back with his leaders in battle. A man that could be counted on. A man that wouldn't back off when the heat was found. Paul described Epaphroditus as an active, loyal, militant, skilled warrior, experienced fighter, military strategist, a brave warrior, a man of distinguished valor. I don't know about you this morning, but I want somebody to describe me as active, loyal, militant, a man of distinguished valor. Epaphroditus was a man that every pastor prays for. Huh? Come on, somebody. Epaphroditus represents what every pastor's wife prays for. Oh, you don't hear me this morning. I pray for some active, loyal, militant, skilled, experienced, brave men of valor in the house of God. That's what I pray for. Huh? That's what I get up and I pray for. I say, God, give me some men that aren't lazy. Huh? Men that are brothers that have some care and concern for others. Give me some men that will labor side by side with me. God, you've given me a, a great calling for this city and for this county, God. There's so much that you've, you've called me to do, so much that you've called our ministry to do. God, raise up some active, some loyal, some militant men and women that are ready to battle regardless of what we face, that are ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. However he hits, they're ready to fight and press forward. Raise up some mighty men of valor within our church. And I think we have some all the way from Oildale this morning. Huh? God brought some men and women here this morning. It's your first time, but listen, your life is never going to be the same. You walked into a church like you have never been in before. Every man and woman that you see on this pulpit singing, or preaching, opening up the service, opening up in prayer, picking up money. Come on, somebody. Every person you see up here came from a background that wasn't God's background. Huh? They, were not, they weren't raised in the church. Most of them were raised on the streets. Huh? Most of them you wouldn't even trust before they came to God. And most of them you would stay away from if you've seen them walking down the streets. 
Huh? But God is able to do miracles upon our life. God is able to do what the world says can't be done. My God is able to do. And God is calling us to be active, loyal. Man, I, I, I love that word loyal. I got to be careful how I use it because some people get hurt. But loyal. Huh? Militant. See, I, I, I want some men that have some strategy in their lives. Well, Pastor, I, I'm married. I have children. I have to provide for them, but I know what I'm called to do. Huh? They have some strategy in their life. They know where they're going. They know where God has brought them. They know what God is doing within their life, and they know where they're going. That's the type of men and women that we need in our ministry. Huh? Militant men, loyal men, active men, brave men. Huh? We, we need those men and women that, that aren't, aren't hiding from the enemy. They're pursuing the enemy. Huh? That's what we need. Huh? You know what happens? You know what happens when we pursue? Our life changes. Huh? Because see, when you're on the defensive side, you know, you watch football. The Rams didn't win yesterday. But, but it doesn't matter because it's preseason. So it don't matter. Huh? The Raiders lost too, but they're used to it. They lost too, so. Huh? But you know, when you're on the, when you're on the defensive side, all you're doing is you're constantly getting hit. Huh? That's what the defense is made of. That's why they're all big and they're all, you know, they're all yoked out like me right now. They're just, you know, that's all they do. They're there to defend. And so when they, when they, when they take off, all they do, all they do is, is just hit. Just hit. Just defend. Just defend. Just stop them from getting their quarterback. Just, just stop them. All they do is defend. So they're constantly getting hit. That's how a Christian is. That's just defending. They're always getting hit. But when you're on the offensive side, then all you're doing is ready to, okay, this, this fool's going to try to hit me, but I'm going to get around him, right? Right? And I'm going to go for the pass, right? So they, it's, like they're, it's like they're given wings and they're able to run and experience the game of football. They're able to experience, you know, the cheers from the crowd when they're running down the field and that ball is coming to them. They're able to experience what the defenders never experience. And that's how you and I got to get. We got to get to that place where we're not just defending what God has given us, but we say, man, you know what? I am tired of just staying on the line. I'm tired of just defending what I got. It's time for me to get on the offensive side. It's time for me to not hide from the devil. I'm going to start looking for the devil. I'm going to start fighting for my family. I'm going to start fighting for my, my wife and children. That's when things begin to change in our life. You're looking for some excitement? Get on the offensive side. Huh? If you want more excitement, be a Rams fan. Huh? I want you to stand with me. See, there's a wave going on in the ministry right now. Huh? There's a wave. And you know that God is looking for Epaphroditus. That's what God is looking for. Can you imagine being co-signed by the Apostle Paul? Huh? Can you imagine being co-signed by the Apostle Paul? One of the greatest men in the New Testament? Can you, have, can you imagine having a letter of recommendation signed by the Apostle Paul? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what that did for Epaphroditus? When he got home to the church in Philippi, can you imagine? He started living a life that he wasn't living before he left. And that's what God's able to do when we become a fellow worker, huh? A fellow soldier. When we start taking that place and applying what God has given us, we start experiencing things we've never experienced before. Epaphroditus went home with a letter. 
Actually, the letter got there before him. So when people got the letter and read this about Epaphroditus, hey, hey, didn't we send him over there just to go help? He's just going to be a, a gopher over there. We just sent him to run around. But something happened in his life. The apostle Paul is telling us to honor him. Oh, come on, somebody. The apostle Paul is telling us to honor him and honor men like him. See, when you start to fall in line, your life changes. My life has changed. Sometimes I, sometimes I get overwhelmed and touched by what the Lord's done in my life. Some of you just don't know what God does when you surrender fully. He changes your life. I'm living a life today that I would have never imagined even in my wildest dreams that I would be living today. I would never imagine that. The life that I'm living today and all that God has done for me. I'm a pastor today of the greatest church in Victory Outreach. Huh? God has blessed me tremendously. I have the best wife that anybody could ever, ever ask for. She's not only beautiful, she doesn't age. I'm getting really mad at her because she doesn't age. She loves God. We've been through some battles fighting for this church, this city. She's always been by my side. God has blessed me with four beautiful boys, beautiful daughter-in-laws, nine grandkids. I pastor the greatest church. I have the greatest pastoral staff that anybody could ask for, the greatest leadership that any pastor could ask for, the greatest congregation. There's nobody ugly in our church. I thank God every day for that. There's nobody ugly in our church. Man, it's amazing. Because I've been to some victory outreaches. I'm like, oh, I don't think we serve the same God. Because uh, ain't, no ain't no ugly people in our church. But you got some ugly people here, man, you know. Not here. We ain't even got no ugly people in our church. I'm living a life that I would have never experienced if I didn't dive in wholeheartedly. And that's what God is offering you today. That all you got to do is just dive in wholeheartedly. And your life will never be the same. Huh? Never be the same. And it's for anybody. Whether it's your first time here. Or maybe you served God before and you fell away but you barely came back. It's for you too. Huh? Maybe you've been here for years and you, didn't, you never jumped in. This is your time. You're still in your allotted time. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. I want everybody to raise your hands as we sing this song right now.